Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaskar students and welcome to Swayam Prabha. I am Professor Bageshwari Deswal, a professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. We are doing this course on Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita 2023, which is the substantive criminal law. Today, we will be discussing offenses against property in our 18th session of this case of this course. So in this chapter, we will be dealing with the following offenses against property, theft, extortion, robbery, decoity, dishonest misappropriation of property, criminal breach of trust, receiving stolen property, cheating, mischief and criminal trespass. To begin with, let us talk about what constitutes theft? See, theft is something which amounts to stealing. So, what is it that makes it punishable under the law? We all know that taking property that belongs to someone else is wrong. But what are the particular dimensions which constitute the crime of theft? That is what has been defined under section 303 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. It says, whoever intending to take dishonestly. So first thing is dishonest intention, any movable property, okay? the nature of property that can be the subject matter of theft have to, has to be necessarily movable property out of the possession of any person. See here the law says out of possession of any person. The law does not say out of the possession of the owner. See, there is a difference between ownership and possession and the law against theft. What does it safeguard is possession without that person's consent. The next ingredient is without the consent of the person in whose possession the movable property is. And then what is required to be done? Moves that property in order to such taking. See, property has been moved. Why has it been moved? with the objective of taking it away. See, it is not that the property has just been moved from one place and kept at another place, just as it is. When the property has been moved in order to take it away, then what amounts is theft. So what are the essential ingredients? One is movable property. It is only movable property that can be the subject matter of theft. Now what is movable property? It has been defined under section 2 clause 21 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita and the definition of movable property has also undergone a change. See at the time when the Britishers enacted the Indian Penal Code in the year 1860, at that time the definition of movable property was different. But in contemporary times we come across theft of data. So now data theft is not something which would be covered under the definition of movable property which was given by the Britishers say around 170 years ago. So now the new law, it tells us that what is movable property? It includes property of every description except land and things attached to the earth or permanently fastened to anything which is attached to the earth. So when we say property of every description, what does it mean? It means it could be corporeal as well as incorporeal property. So it means that now even intangible property can be the subject matter of theft. So it is property of every description except land, land is immovable property, things attached to the earth, a tree it is immovable property. The moment it is severed from earth, it becomes movable property. 
anything permanently fastened to anything which is attached to the earth. So, permanently fastened. If it has been removed, so then it could be, it could become a movable property. So, then the character of the property may change. And then again, immovable property will also include intangible things now. Next is dishonest intention. So, dishonestly has been defined under section 2 clause 7 of the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita to mean doing anything with the intention of causing wrongful gain to one person and wrongful loss to another person. So, students what is wrongful gain and what is wrongful loss? See when I get something that I am not legally supposed to get, I am not legally entitled to get that thing. So, that is a wrongful gain to me. And what is wrongful loss? When I suffer any loss, something which I was not supposed to suffer as per the law. I was supposed to get something, but I did not get something. So, that is that unlawful loss or that wrongful gain or wrongful loss. So, that is the objective uh, behind the definition dishonestly. That is what is dishonestly? When you do something with the intention that by this act somebody is going to get a wrongful gain and somebody is going to suffer a wrongful loss. So, that is how we interpret the term dishonestly. Next is it should be out of possession. So, law relating to theft it safeguards the possession. The question of ownership would be decided at a later date. So, what is required to be seen is that the property should be taken out of the possession. If somebody has a possession from that possession if you take away the property the one who has taken away the property without the consent of the person in whose possession that property was, the person would amount to, uh, the offence would amount to the offence of theft and the other person would be accused of stealing that thing. But suppose a thief has stolen some property and then someone else subsequently takes away that property from that thief. So, now the subsequent taker is also a thief, okay, because what the law safeguards is possession. Then without consent. If somebody takes away your property with your consent, there is no theft. The consent could be expressed, it could be implied. See, you have friends, you might have a say, tacit understanding or impliedly you know that see, we can use each other's stuff, we can use each other's belts, we can use each other's watches or any maybe some uh, piece of costume jewelry or something like that. And if you share it, even without that person's consent, provide you have that kind of a tacit understanding. But if you know that see this person is very, very possessive about his belongings and the person would not like to share it and despite that you take that property, you wear it and even if you keep it back, still it would amount to theft. Because if you have caused a wrongful loss to that person, even for a short duration of time, still that would amount to the offence of theft. So, wherever there is consent, there would be no theft. Consent could be expressed, consent could be implied. but. When there is a lack of consent, the other person has not consented, still you have taken that thing out of that person's possession that would amount to the crime of theft. Moving of property in order to take it away. See, you have moved a property and you want to take it away. You move a property in someone's house, you hide it under the carpet, you hide it in a drawer and the intention is to take away that property at a later date when maybe the loss is forgotten. So, when you move it in order to take it away, Although the property still is in the owner's possession, okay, but still you have moved it in order to take it away with a dishonest intention and out of the possession of the owner or out of the knowledge. So, it would amount to the offence of theft. There are certain explanations appended to this section which further clarify what amounts to theft. A thing, so long as it is attached to the earth, not being movable property is not the subject of theft. Why? Because what can be the subject matter of theft? Only movable property. So, a thing so long as it is attached to earth not being movable property is not the subject of theft, but it becomes capable of being the subject of theft as soon as it is severed from the earth. Explanation 2. A moving affected by the same act which affects the severance may be theft. Okay. Suppose there is a cart which is positioned at a place and then there is something which has been kept under the wheels of the cart and that is that has been permanently fastened into the earth, that particular object so that the cart cannot move. 
the moment you have removed that thing which was permanently fastened to the earth due to which the moving of that cart has been affected downhill. Now that in itself would amount to the offence of theft. A person is said to cause a thing to move by removing an obstacle which prevented it from moving or by separating it from any other thing as well as by actually moving it. So, even if you have removed an obstacle which prevented anything from moving or if you have separated it from any other thing, you have actually pushed it, you have actually moved it. So, that would all amount to moving in order to that taking. A person who by any means causes an animal to move is said to move that animal and to move everything which in consequence of the motion so caused is moved by that animal. Suppose that animal is carrying a load of some thing. Now, that thing has also moved in consequence of the movement of the animal. Suppose there is somebody's pet dog wearing a very expensive collar. When you move that animal, the collar has also moved along with. So, that would also amount to theft. The consent mentioned in this section. See, Whenever something is taken by consent, it does not amount to theft. So, here the consent that is being talked about may be expressed or it may be implied and may be given either by the person in possession or by any person having for that purpose authority either express or implied. Okay, suppose you visit your friend's house in his absence and there is a very good book lying on his table and the, his, the friend's mother is in the house. Now, you want to read that book, but you know that your friend did not want to give you that book, but the mother is there and you ask the mother for that book and the mother gives the consent. So, if you have taken that book with the consent of someone else who was in the authority either express or implied and if you have taken it with the consent of the mother and you have an intention of giving it back, then it would not amount to theft. But if you were very clear that see the friend will not give it at any cost and you take try to take permission from the mother that would also be wrong because the property is actually in the possession of the friend. So, even if you are trying to manipulate your way into getting that thing that would be wrong as per the law. Now, illustrations. A cuts down a tree on Z's ground with the intention of dishonestly taking the tree out of Z's possession without Z's consent. Here, as soon as A has severed the tree in order to such taking, he has committed theft. Why? Because the moment a tree is severed from the ground, it becomes movable property and movable property can be the subject matter of theft. A puts a bait for dogs in his pocket and thus induces Z's dog to follow it. Here, if A's intention be dishonestly to take the dog out of Z's possession without Z's consent, A has committed theft as soon as Z's dog has begun to follow A. Then, A meets a bullock carrying a box of treasure. He drives the bullock in a certain direction in order that he may dishonestly take the treasure. As soon as the bullock begins to move, A has committed theft of treasure because you have moved an animal and in consequence of the movement of the animal, anything that the animal is carrying has also been moved. A being Z's servant and entrusted by Z with the care of Z's, placed, uh, Z's plate, dishonestly runs away with the plate without Z's consent, A has committed theft. Now, see here, the servant was entrusted with the care. He was not supposed to run away with the plate. And here, look at the illustration. It says, dishonestly runs away. Dishonestly means that the act was done with the intention of causing wrongful gain to himself and wrongful loss to the owner of that plate. So, that would amount to the offence of theft. Z, going on a journey, entrusts his plate to A the keeper of a warehouse till Z shall return. Now, what does A does? What does A do? He carries the plate to a goldsmith and sells it. Here the plate was not in Z's possession. It could not be therefore taken out of Z's possession. See, theft is an offence against possession. 
here when you have already entrusted your plate to someone else, so now it is in someone else's possession. And what that other person do? The other person betrays your trust. He takes it to the goldsmith to get it converted or to sell it. Here the plate was not in your own possession, so it cannot be taken out of Z's possession and so it cannot be the subject, so it cannot be stolen. Why it cannot be stolen? Because it was not taken out of your possession. You had yourselves handed over the possession to someone else. But that does not mean that the act is not wrong. The act will not amount to theft, but he has committed here criminal breach of trust. Now, what is criminal breach of trust is when you specifically entrust your someone, your property to someone and that person commits a breach of that trust. Okay? So, for breach of trust, there has to be entrustment and the other person has to breach that trust. Only then does breach of trust take place. Then, illustration F, A finds a ring belonging to Z on a table in the house which Z occupies. So, in Z's house, A finds Z's ring. Here the ring is in Z's possession and if A dishonestly removes it, what has A committed? Theft. Now, A finds a ring lying on the high road, not in the possession of any person. So, again see theft is an offence against possession and if you come across something which is lying on the road, it is not in someone's possession. Does it mean that anyone is free to take it? The answer is no. It would not constitute theft, but that does not mean that it is a legal act. See, here A by taking it commits no theft, though he may commit criminal misappropriation of property. Because see here, the property is not in anyone else's possession. You know that this is no one else's property, but you also know that this is not your property. So, despite knowing that if you take that property and you use it for yourself, that is criminal misappropriation of property. Then illustration H, A sees a ring belonging to Z lying on a table in Z's house. Not venturing to misappropriate the ring immediately for fear of search and detection, A hides the ring in a place where it is highly improbable that it will ever be found by Z with the intention of taking the ring from the hiding place and selling it when the loss is forgotten. Here A, at the time of first moving the ring, commits theft. Illustration I. A delivers his watch to Z, a jeweler to be regulated. Z carries it to his shop. A, not owing to the jeweler any debt for which the jeweler might lawfully detain the watch as a security, enters the shop openly, takes his watch by force out of Z's hand and carries it away. Here A, though he may have committed criminal trespass and assault, has not committed theft in as much as what he did was not done dishonestly. Here on C, on one hand we say that theft is an offence against possession. Now in this illustration, a person has specifically handed over his watch to another person. Then what he does? He enters the shop of that person and forcibly takes away his watch from that person's possession. Still it does not amount to theft. It would be theft why if, what would have happened? If he owed some money to that person who was regulating the watch. Suppose the person had already worked on the watch and he owed some money to that person. And in that case, if he does not make the payment and he takes the watch away, then what happens? We presume the dishonest intention. Why do we presume it? Because as per the definition of dishonest intention given under the law, if you cause a wrongful gain and a wrongful loss to someone, it amounts to dishonest intention. So, if you do not give the money to the person and that amount is due to that person, that would have translated into dishonest intention and then it would have amounted to theft. But here, although the person has taken away his property out of the possession of someone else without the consent of that person, but it was not done with a dishonest intention because no loss was caused here to the one who was regulating the watch. So, because there is a lack of dishonest intention, it would not amount to theft, but it may amount to assault, it may amount to criminal trespass because he has entered into someone else's uh, property and taken away something from there. So, it could be trespass, it could also be assault, but it would not be theft. And why would it not be theft? Because of lack of dishonest intention here. Next, again A 
having pawned his watch to Z, takes it out of Z's possession without Z's consent, not having paid what he borrowed on the watch. Now here he commits theft, though the watch is his own property. But why does it amount to theft? Because he has taken it dishonestly. What constitutes dishonesty here? He has not paid the money back, the one that he had borrowed on that watch. He pawns his watch, then he takes back the watch without repaying the money. So this tantamounts to dishonest intention. Next illustration. A takes an article belonging to Z out of Z's possession without Z's consent with the intention of keeping it until he obtains money from Z as a reward for its restoration. See what has A done? The article belongs to Z. He takes it away from Z's uh, possession. He does not seek Z's consent and now what he plans is that I am going to keep this with myself till the time he does not pay me some money as a reward for returning it back to him. Why should he pay you the money? If he has to pay you that money, it is a dishonest intention on your part to cause a wrongful gain to yourself and a wrongful loss to that person. It is not that the object was stolen and you just got it and now you are expecting a reward. You have taken it out of his possession without his consent and now you are expecting a reward. What is the law going to give you? Punishment. So here A takes dishonestly. A has therefore committed theft. Illustration M. A being on friendly terms with Z goes into Z's library in Z's absence and takes away a book without Z's express consent for the purpose merely of reading it and with the intention of returning it. See from the facts that have been laid down under the in the illustration. So what it says A is on friendly terms with Z. Although Z is not at home. A has gone into Z's library in his absence and what he does, he takes away the book. He has not expressly taken the consent of uh, Z but the objective of A is just to read it and he also has the intention of returning it. Here it is probable that A may have conceived that he had Z's implied consent to use Z's book. If this was A's impression, A has not committed theft. But suppose let me just add upon it. He takes the book home. He believes that he had his friend's consent. When he gets the book home, he realizes that let me keep this book for book to myself. Anyway, Z does not know that I have taken this book and I have no intention of informing his, him also and I have no intention of returning the book also. Now you have developed a dishonest intention. But dishonest intention has developed at a later stage, not at the time when you removed the book in order to take it away. So it is not theft, but it would amount to dishonest misappropriation of property. Now, another illustration, illustration N. A asks charity from Z's wife. She gives A money, food and clothes which A knows to belong to Z, her husband. Here it is probable that A may conceive that Z's wife is authorized to give away arms. If this was A's impression, A has not committed theft. Now illustration O. A is the paramour of Z's wife. So now you see illustration O is different from illustration N because in the first A is asking for charity and in illustration O, A is here the paramour of Z's wife. Now she gives a valuable property which the paramour knows to belong to her husband Z and to be such property as she has no authority from her husband to give. Now if A takes away that property dishonestly despite knowing that this is a property which belongs to this woman's husband and she does not have any authority to give away that property to me. Despite knowing that he takes it away dishonestly here, how is the dishonest intention? Because he has the intention to cause a wrongful gain to himself and a wrongful loss to that man. So if he does that dishonestly, it would amount to the offense of theft. Illustration P. A in good faith, believing property belonging to Z to be A's own property, takes that property out of Z's possession. See, there is a possibility. There's a friend, I go to that friend's house, I see a watch and I see, oh, this is my watch. 
and I have somehow misplaced my watch and I think that maybe my friend has taken away my watch. So I, or maybe my friend has mistakenly brought this watch here. So what I do, I pick up that watch and I carry it home. Now here, what does the illustration say? A, in good faith. Good faith, that is by exercising due care and caution. I have no intentions whatsoever here to cause any harm to the friend because there is no dishonest intention. There is no intention to cause any wrongful gain or wrongful loss to anyone. So if A, in good faith, believing property belonging to Z to be A's own property takes that property out of Z's possession. Here, as A does not take dishonestly, he does not commit theft. But what would happen if I bring the watch home and after two days I find my watch? So now if I decide to keep the other watch also, so what has happened? Now I have developed a dishonest intention and then I can be held guilty not for theft. Why? Because at the time when I moved it in order to take it, I did not have the dishonest intention. So there cannot be theft, but there would be nonetheless criminal misappropriation of property. And in case after getting to know what the truth is, I return the watch, then there is no crime whatsoever. Now punishment for crime. What does the law say? Clause 2, whoever commits theft shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or with both. And in case of second or subsequent conviction of any person under this section. So that is one who is an habitual offender, one who has already been convicted for stealing and the person again commits theft. Then such cases, the accused shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than one year, but which may extend to five years and with fine. Provided. Now this proviso is a new addition to the BNS. This has been introduced by the BNS 2023. Now this is a very progressive provision in keeping with the spirit of the title which is Nyay Sahita in a bid to effect justice to our people. So what does the proviso say? Provided that in cases of theft where the value of stolen property is less than 5000 rupees and a person is convicted for the first time such person shall upon return of the value of property or restoration of the stolen property be punished with community service. See in community service or not a person is not put in uh, put behind bars. So this is a non-custodial punishment. This is a kind of a reformative approach in which we are not socially isolating the offender. We are allowing the op offender an opportunity to make amends for the wrongs that was done by that offender. So some sort of a community service he is asked to do provided he restores either the stolen property or he restores the value of that stolen property provided the value of property was less than 5000 rupees and also if he was a first time convict. If he is a repeat offender, he is not entitled to this proviso. For this proviso, what is required is that first time thief, value of property that was stolen should not be more than 5000 rupees and further what is the person required to do? Either he should restore the property or what he should do is he should restore the value of the property that was stolen by him. Then coming to section 304 snatching. See student snatching that is stealing by force by some sort of an immediate movement. Now what happens in snatching it is something which can cause a hurt also to any person if while snatching this person falls or some body part is harmed. Now snatching was not a crime under our central law which is the Indian Penal Code although there are states such as Haryana and Gujarat where snatching was a crime in their penal statutes. Now we have specifically introduced a provision for snatching in the Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. What does section 304 say? Theft is snatching. So it was only theft that can amount to snatching. So what, require, what is required is that there should be movable property, there should be dishonest intention, the property should be taken out of the possession of the person and it should be done without the consent of that person. So all ingredients of theft must be necessarily present in further it may amount to snatching if in order to commit theft the offender suddenly or quickly or forcibly seizes or secures or grabs or takes away from any person 
or from his possession any movable property. So, theft would amount to snatching provided in the commission of that theft what has the offender done? He has suddenly, quickly or forcibly seized or secured or grabbed or taken away from any person or from the possession of the person any movable property. So, snatching what is the punishment for that? Imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 3 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, now we have a specific provision for snatching. Coming next to section 305 which deals with theft in a dwelling house or means of transportation or place of worship etc. See theft in itself is wrong, but when theft is committed in a dwelling house or a place which is a means of transportation like from a car or if it is done from a place of worship, then what would be the punishment? Law says whoever commits theft in any building, tent or vessel used as a human dwelling or used for the custody of property or on any means of transport used for the transport of goods or passengers or of any article or goods from any means of transport used for the transport of goods or passengers or of idol, idol or icon in any place of worship or of any property of the government or of a local authority shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine. So, there is a higher punishment when theft is committed from a dwelling house, from a means of transportation or from a place of worship. Then section 306 talks about theft by clerk or servant of property in possession of master. Whoever being a clerk or servant or being employed in the capacity of a clerk or servant commits theft in respect of any property in the possession of his master or employer shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine. Then section 307 talks about theft after preparation made for causing death, hurt or restraint in order to commission of theft. What does the law say? Whoever commits theft having made preparation for causing death or hurt or restraint or fear of death or of hurt or of restraint to any person in order to the committing of such theft or in order to the effecting of his escape after the committing of such theft or in order to the retaining of property taken by such theft shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years. See the punishment is proportionate to the gravity of the crime and shall also be liable to fine. Look at the illustrations here. A commits theft on property in Z's possession and while committing this theft, he has a loaded pistol under his garment having provided this pistol for the purpose of hurting Z in case Z should resist. So, A has committed the offence defined in this section. Then A picks Z pocket having posted several of his companions near him in order that they may restrain Z if Z should perceive what is passing and should resist or should attempt to apprehend A. So, A has committed the offence defined in this section. So, that is a graver form of theft. When you have done that theft with the preparations that if required maybe I can even cause the death of the other person or cause hurt to him or I can restrain the person if the person resists me from commission of theft or if the person tries to apprehend me. After the offence of theft, now let us talk about the crime of extortion which is defined under section 308. See the basic difference between theft and extortion is in theft there is taking of property, whereas in extortion there is delivery of property. See in extortion the other person, the one who extorts you created situations scares you to an extent that you yourself deliver the property to that person. 
whereas in theft what you do is you have taken away that property so that is the basic difference and in extortion there is some threat or fear of threat which has to be necessarily accompanied now theft can be done with use of force also theft can be done in a very stealthy manner also so for extortion whoever intentionally puts any person in fear of any injury to that person or to any other and thereby dishonestly induces the person so put in fear to deliver to any person any property or valuable security so students hear the term that is used as property it is not qualified by the term movable property or immovable property and further it talks about valuable security so any document that is capable of being converted into monetary terms so the property immovable property can also be the subject of extortion because see you cannot pick up a land you cannot pick up a house and deliver it to someone but obviously you can deliver the papers of that property to someone so while in theft only movable property can be the subject matter of theft in extortion it could be either movable or immovable property which can be the subject matter of theft and that is why it says any property or valuable security and then further what is required is intention of putting any person in fear of any injury to that person or to any other okay somebody threatens you if you will not deliver that money to me i'll harm your spouse i'll harm your child so that is again something i have not been put in threat of hurt but someone else has been put in threat of hurt again how do you interpret the term dishonestly here the definition has already been given in the law when anything is done with the intention of causing a wrongful gain to someone and a wrongful loss to someone so if i am inducing someone to deliver some money to me so it means i am causing a wrongful gain to myself and wrongful loss to that other person so it means there is a dishonest intention on my part for extortion also dishonest intention is required induces the person so put in fear to deliver to any person so i might take the delivery of that property that valuable security myself or i might ask that the property be delivered to someone else on my behalf still that would amount to extortion okay any property or valuable security or anything signed or sealed which may be converted into a valuable security commits extortion now look at the illustrations a threatens to publish a defamatory libel concerning z unless z gives him money he thus induces z to give him money a has committed extortion so if you have threatened that unless and until you'll give me money i'll publish a defamatory statement regarding you so you have extorted that person to pay you money so that has caused a wrongful loss to that person and a wrongful gain you got something that you were not legally entitled to receive and the person had to lose something which he was not legally entitled to lose and you've caused him to deliver that money to you by putting him under a threat that unless and until he pays you the money you are going to publish some defamatory statement against him so that would amount to the crime of extortion illustration b a threatens z that he will keep z's child in wrongful confinement unless z will sign and deliver to a a promissory note binding z to pay certain monies to a z signs and delivers the note a has committed extortion a by putting z in fear of grievous hurt dishonestly induces z to sign or affix his seal to a blank paper and deliver it to a z signs and delivers the paper to a here as the paper so signed may be converted into a valuable security a has committed extortion a threatens z by sending a message through an electronic device that your child is in my possession and will be put to death unless you send me 1 lakh rupees what has a done he has induced z to give him money so what has a done he has committed extortion by threatening to harm the child in case the money is not delivered to him so this amounts to the crime of extortion now coming to the crime of robbery 
See, robbery is an aggravated form of theft or extortion. So that is why we systematically proceed. First, we need to understand what is theft. Then we need to understand what is extortion and how theft is different from extortion. After that, we proceed to understand what is robbery. So in all robbery, there is either theft or extortion. Theft is robbery if in order to committing of the theft or in committing the theft or in carrying away or attempting to carry away property obtained by the theft, the offender for that end voluntarily causes or attempts to cause to any person death or hurt or wrongful restraint or fear of instant death or of instant hurt or of instant wrongful restraint. So what is robbery? It is an aggravated form of theft where the other person has been put in fear of instant hurt. Then extortion is robbery if the offender at the time of committing the extortion is in the presence of the person put in fear and commits the extortion by putting that person in fear of instant death, instant hurt or of instant wrongful restraint to that person or to some other person and by so putting in fear induces the person so put in fear then and there to deliver up the thing extorted. <clears throat> the offender is said to be present if he is sufficiently near to put the other person in fear of instant death. See because here what is the law is talking about is fear of instant death, fear of instant hurt or fear of instant wrongful restraint. So you see what is robbery? It is an aggravated form of theft <coughs> or an aggravated form of extortion. Robbery by itself is not a separate crime. It is only theft which may amount to robbery or extortion which may amount to robbery. But one, when does theft or extortion amount to robbery? When it is accompanied by a threat of instant hurt or of instant uh, death or threat of instant wrongful restraint. Now certain illustrations related to robbery. A holds Z down and fraudulently takes Z's money and jewels from Z's clothes without Z's consent. Here A has committed theft and in order to the committing of that theft has voluntarily caused wrongful restraint to Z. A has therefore committed robbery because force was used herein and there was a threat of, you, of instant hurt to the other person. So now here theft would amount to robbery. Illustration B. A meets Z on the high road, shows a pistol and demands Z's purse. Now Z in consequence surrenders his purse. Here A has extorted the purse from Z by putting him in fear of instant hurt and being at the time of committing the extortion in his presence. So what has A committed here? Robbery. Because instant fear of threat you have put that person in and you have demanded him to deliver his purse. Now if you had taken the purse that would be theft. He has delivered the purse to you so it amounts to extortion. But in either case because it is accompanied with threat of instant hurt it is robbery. Illustration C. A meets Z and Z's child on the high road. A takes the child and threatens to fling it down a precipice unless Z delivers his purse. Z in consequence delivers the purse. Here A has extorted the purse from Z by causing Z to be in fear of instant hurt to the child who is there present. A has therefore committed robbery on Z. So you see you might be putting someone in fear of instant hurt or instant death. Now the one who is put in this fear, the fear might be regarding himself, the fear might be regarding someone else but what is required is fear of instant hurt. So here since the child was also there and the other person says that unless you deliver your purse to me I am going to fling the child away, 
what happens there is a fear of instant hurt creates and created in the minds of the of the other person and he delivers the purse this is something that amounts to robbery a obtains property from z by saying your child is in the hands of my gang and will be put to death unless you send us 10000 rupees this is extortion and punishable as such but it is not robbery because here there is no fear of instant death of the child extortion it is still but it would not amount to robbery here so you can find the difference between illustration c and death in illustration c there was the fear of instant death of the child in illustration d there is not that fear of instant death so there is extortion but there is no robbery in illustration d subsection 4 so whoever commits robbery shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine and if the robbery be committed on the highway between sunset and sunrise the imprisonment may extend to 14 years so punishment for robbery is it may extend up to 10 years and depending upon the place where such robbery was committed if it was committed on the highway and that too at night that is after sunset and before sunrise then what is the imprisonment prescribed it may go up to 14 years whoever attempts to commit robbery shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 7 years and shall also be liable to fine and if any person in committing or in attempting to commit robbery voluntarily causes hurt such person and any other person jointly concerned in committing or attempting to commit such robbery shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine so all the punishments they are proportionate to the crime that is to be prevented now coming to what amounts to dacoity section 310 defines dacoity whenever five or more persons conjointly commit or attempt to commit a robbery or where the whole number of persons conjointly committing or attempting to commit a robbery and persons present in aiding such commission or attempt amount to five or more every person so committing attempting or aiding is said to commit dacoity so for dacoity what is required is there should be a minimum five number of people second it should be done conjointly okay so what is it five or more persons and then what it says five or more so when there are five people in total some of them are committing robbery others are aiding such commission of robbery or attempt to commit robbery or dacoity then what happens they would all be held guilty for the offense of dacoity irrespective of one person was actually threatening the other one whom they were planning to rob the other one was just aiding him the other uh, third was abetting the such act but liability of all would be the same because the essence of the offense of dacoity is conjointly that is they are all jointly committing or attempting to commit a robbery so it is the common intention or the common objective which is prevailing here so liability would be joint because they are all acting jointly as a team so liability would be the same of all five of them or any number of people but the minimum number of people present at the scene should be five then whoever commits dacoity shall be punished with imprisonment for life or rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine see why do we prescribe a higher punishment for dacoity is because of the number of people who are involved minimum 5 people 5 and more people conjointly committing an act obviously the gravity of the offense it goes up so the punishment also goes up then uh, clause 3 if any one of five or more persons who are conjointly committing dacoity commits murder and so committing dacoity every one of those persons shall be punished with death or imprisonment for life or rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 10 years and shall also be liable to fine see 
because murder has been committed by one of those people who were all committing the dacoity, but the dacoity was being conducted conjointly. So irrespective of the one who has actually committed the murder, all those who were in the process with him and all those who were committing the dacoity with him conjointly, liability would be on all of them and there would be a higher penal penalty that would be prescribed for all of them. Whoever makes any preparation for committing dacoity shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall also be liable to fine. So you see, dacoity is a crime which is punishable even at the stage of preparation. See, in any crime there are four stages, intention, preparation, attempt and the commission of the offence. At the stage of intention, no crime is punishable. At the stage of pun uh, preparation, there are very few crimes which are punishable and dacoity is one of them. So even if you are just preparing to commit dacoity, that in itself is a punishable crime because see what does clause 4 say? Whoever makes any preparation from, for committing dacoity and what is the punishment? Rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years. So this is considered as a very, very serious crime which entails a higher punishment under the law. Where whoever is one of five or more persons assembled for the purpose of com committing dacoity shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to seven years and shall also be liable to fine. So if you are one of the persons who have assembled to commit a dacoity, seven years imprisonment. Whoever belongs to a gang of persons associated for the purpose of habitually committing dacoity. So here we are talking about repeat offenders, those who are habitually committing dacoity. Okay. So if you belong to a gang of dacoits, then the punishment is imprisonment for life or rigorous imprisonment for a term which may extend to 10 years. So even if you just belong to that gang, but that gang is notorious for habitually conducting dacoities. So the law will penalize you irrespective of the fact that you might not have committed any dacoity. But if you belong to the gang of that dacoits, that in itself is punishable with imprisonment up to life or rigorous imprisonment for a term up to 10 years. Then we have furthermore provisions uh, penalizing robbery or dacoity with attempt to cause death or grievous hurt or attempt to commit robbery or dacoity when armed with deadly weapons, punishment for belonging to gang of robbers, etc. So, so on and so forth. After talking about theft, extortion, uh, robbery and dacoity, now we move on to another type of crime against property and that is dishonest misappropriation of property. So here we are talking about dishonest misappropriation for that first thing is there should be a dishonest intention. Now we all know by now what amounts to dishonest intention when there is an intention to cause a wrongful gain to someone or a wrongful loss to someone that amounts to dishonest intention. Misappropriation, appropriation means usage of a property and when there is a non-intended usage of the property that is a misappropriation. The property is mine. I intend it to be used in a particular manner. If someone else, is, else uses that property that would be a misappropriation of my property. And here again we are talking about property. Here again property that is being talked about is only movable property. See dishonest misappropriation can take place only in regards of movable property. So what does the law say? Whoever dishonestly misappropriates or converts to his own use any movable property shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which shall not be less than 6 months but which may extend to 2 years and with fine. Look at the illustrations. A takes property belonging to Z out of Z's possession in good faith believing at the time when he takes it that the property belongs to himself. Now A is not guilty of theft. Why is A not guilty of theft here? Because dishonest intention is lacking. But if A after discovering his mistake dishonestly appropriates the property to his own use, he is guilty of an offence under this section. So when you acquired the property, the intention was not dishonest. But at a subsequent date, you develop a dishonest intention regards the property which is already in your possession. 
So that would not amount to theft. What would it amount to? Dishonest misappropriation of property. Then illustration B. A being on friendly terms with Z goes into Z's library in Z's absence and takes away a book without Z's express consent. Here if A was under the impression that he had Z's implied consent to take the book for the purpose of reading it, A has not committed theft. But if A afterwards sells the book for his own benefit, he is guilty of an offence under this section. Illustration C. A and B being joint owners of a horse, A takes the horse out of B's possession intending to use it. Here as A has a right to use the horse because he is also the joint owner, he does not dishonestly misappropriate it. But if A sells the horse and appropriates the whole proceeds to his own use, he is guilty of an offence under this section because see he was the joint owner. If he has sold the horse and thereafter what does he do? He was just a joint owner but he misappropriates all the proceeds to himself. So this is a dishonest misappropriation of property. Explanation 1. A dishonest misappropriation for a time only is a misappropriation within the meaning of this section. See even for a time being if you have used some property which does not belong to you that in itself is dishonest misappropriation even if it is for a limited time. Let us see an illustration. A finds a government promissory note belonging to Z bearing a blank endorsement. A knowing that the note belongs to Z pledges it with the banker as a security for a loan intending at a future time to restore it to Z. A has committed an offence under this section C even if it is for a limited duration still it is a crime. Explanation 2. A person who finds property not in the possession of any other person and takes such property for the purpose of protecting it for or of restoring it to the owner does not take or misappropriate it dishonestly and is not guilty of an offence. But he is guilty of the offence above defined if he appropriates it to his own use when he knows or has the means of discovering the owner or before he has used reasonable means to discover and give notice to the owner and has kept the property a reasonable time to enable the owner to claim it. Now what are reasonable means or what is reasonable time in such a case is a question of fact. It is not necessary that the finder should know who is the owner of the property or that any particular person is the owner of it. It is sufficient if at the time of appropriating it he does not believe it to be his own property or in good faith believing that the real owner cannot be found. So what is reasonable time it all depends upon the nature of the property. In case of perishable goods, in case you come across uh, some uh, food items that are lying at a place, so there is just a reasonable time till which you will wait before appropriating the same. But the crux, the gist of the crime under this section is that you have misappropriated a property, which sometimes you might not be knowing whose property that is. But one thing you know is that that property is not yours. If still you use it, that is something which amounts to dishonest misappropriation of property. So students that will be all for this session. In the next session we will, we will further continue with remaining offences against property such as criminal breach of trust, uh, mischief, trespass and so on. So that will be all for now. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.